I think I'm going to be talking about inflation a lot this year. Uh, it's really on people's minds, which I'm not necessarily asking why people are thinking about inflation. I think I get that. My question is, why weren't you thinking about inflation a year or two ago or three or five or 10? Inflation's a big deal. It is a big issue with your portfolio. And a good part of your portfolio needs to be designed to combat inflation. That's not new though. When I set my portfolio back 15 plus years ago, inflation was a big deal. It's a big fear. When you talk about the deep risks, that's the phrase that William Bernstein uses. The deep risks to your portfolio are inflation, deflation, confiscation, and devastation. These are the risks, and we're not talking about volatility, the price of your stocks goes up and comes down, whatever, right? You hold on for the long term, that basically disappears. We're talking about the real risks to losing real wealth in after inflation terms. And inflation is the chief among those. It's the most common, if you look historically across different places in the world, it is the one most likely to devastate your portfolio. So this is not something you should be worrying about this year. This is something you should be worrying about all the time, okay? Inflation's a big deal. And when you think about what inflation most affects, we're talking about um, cash, we're talking about nominal bonds, fixed income for the most part, okay? Imagine that you have a scenario, you're going into you know the 1970s and, uh, and you put all this money into 30-year bonds, right? So you get this bond that's paying 4% and then inflation goes to 10%. So you are losing 6% a year every year on that 30-year bond, right? So when you get your principal back, you're getting a whole lot less money in after inflation terms than you took out. Reminds me of the student loan. I took out one student loan. It was an Alaska state student loan. It was an 8% loan. I took it out in 1993 for my freshman year and paid for room and board with it. It's a $5,000 loan. I paid it back in 2010. I was allowed to defer the interest through undergraduate, medical school, residency, and military service. So when I got out of the military in 2010, I paid it back. Essentially, I paid back a $5,000 loan with $3,200 worth of money in 1993 dollars. Okay, so that helped me. Well, it's just, if you're on the opposite end of that, that was not a good deal for Alaska. They didn't get any interest and they got paid back a whole lot less money than they loaned me in the first place. And so inflation was not good to the state of Alaska for that purpose. Um, and that is when you are making investments like that, that's why inflation is bad. Now imagine that you had hyperinflation, not just 5% or 10% a year, but you had inflation of 100% a year or 1000% a year. That's absolutely going to totally wipe out the value of your cash and the value of any of your nominal fixed investments. And so that's a real risk to your portfolio. If your whole portfolio is CDs and treasury bonds, this is a big risk to your portfolio. Okay, so how do you hedge against it? How do you protect yourself against inflation? Well, the main thing is you need assets in your portfolio that are going to outperform inflation. Okay, if it's earning 10% and inflation's 3%, you're making 7% a year, you're still making gains here. Okay, so the, the first thing is you want to have a portfolio that actually makes money right? You want your portfolio to do some of the heavy lifting for you. So it's not just brute force savings for everything you'll need in retirement. So what are we talking about? We're talking about risky asset classes, stocks, right? Ownership, equity in companies, okay? real estate, right? You're taking significant risk there when you're investing in real estate. And so you get paid more in general over the long term. And so you outpace inflation. Um, there are some fixed investments that can help with inflation. Two primary ones are TIPS, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, and I bonds, a special type of savings bonds that are indexed to inflation. And they can help offset inflation. Now, that's so important to me in my portfolio design that not only do I have 60% of my portfolio in stocks and 20% in real estate, that's 80% in stuff I expect to dramatically outperform inflation, but half of my bonds are in inflation index bonds, TIPS. And so they help combat inflation. Now, the downside of TIPS and I-bonds is if you don't believe the government's measure of inflation. I need to get into this in a blog post in depth, but uh, the bottom line is the only inflation that matters is your personal inflation and the stuff you buy and how fast that's going up in price. If you're buying stuff that's going down in price, 
then uh, inflation doesn't matter so much to you. But if you're consuming things that are rising faster than the general rate of inflation, education, healthcare, right? Housing right now has been going crazy, both rents and, you know, buying houses. If that's the stuff you need to buy in the future, you know, then the CPI, the, the consumer price index that the government's measuring, maybe doesn't uh, have enough of that in it in order to really describe your personal rate of inflation. And so people come up with some other measures of inflation. And when they use them, they say, inflation is 10%. It's something terrible. Now, it's not 10%. When I go to the store and I go to the, you know, buy gas, 10% inflation a year is huge. I mean, it is a massive devaluation in your money and its value and what it can buy. And, uh, and we're clearly not seeing that. It's a very different experience than people had in the 70s when they were really in an inflationary environment. Um, but is it possible that general inflation is higher than the government has stated it is? Sure it is. And if that's a big fear of yours, then I bonds and tips are probably not your thing. Because yes, they compensate you for unexpected inflation, but they measure that based on the CPI. So that leaves other things that are not dollars. They're not fixed income, right? We got things like other currencies. Do you think they're going to do well in relationship to the dollar? We got things like um, uh, gold and silver, right? Precious metals. And why do people use precious metals? Well, because traditionally, over the long run, they've kept up with inflation. They haven't outpaced inflation like stocks and real estate and even bonds have, but they've kept up with inflation. And in really bad times, people tend to put their money into that stuff, further jacking up the price. And so, you know, in the 1970s, gold did very well. And part of that was fear, this flight to safety, flight to a non-devaluing uh, asset. And part of it was simply gold keeping up with inflation. Um, cryptocurrencies, people think those might play a role in combating inflation as well. They're so new. I don't think we really know that yet. There's a good chance they could. You want to put a couple percent of your portfolio in there, knock yourself out. But you know what? I said that a few months ago. Then I went to the Grand Canyon. Bitcoin was 60,000. I came back, it was 30,000. So that's a lot of volatility just to hedge against inflation. You better like it for more reasons than that. If you want to put a little bit of your money into cryptocurrency. Um, so what else did you ask about? You asked about small value stocks. I don't know that there are any better about inflation than any other stocks. The idea, however, is that higher performance has a higher return, higher risk. And uh, so you expect it to outperform inflation by more over the long run. Um, real estate, however, probably has a special place when it comes to inflation for a couple of reasons. One, you can raise rents with inflation. And of course, the value of the property goes up with inflation. So that's good. But on the other side, it's generally leveraged and it's often leveraged with fixed debt, which is awesome. It's a great hedge in inflation, right? I'm not a big fan of debt. I'm not going to tell you to keep your mortgage around forever, your student loans around forever, but fixed low interest rate loans and in inflation, they're a pretty good inflation hedge, right? If inflation is 10% and your debt's at 3%, right? You're basically making 7% a year on your debt, right? That's pretty cool that way. Um, and so, but real estate's leveraged often with fixed debt. And so you're winning on both sides. You're raising rents and your debt costs you less in after inflation terms each year. And so that's why real estate's may be particularly good in inflation. Hope that answers your question. We'll try to get into that more on the blog. Um, but yeah, inflation's a big deal. I don't know why people are just now starting to pay attention to it just because CPI went from 2% to 4%. Um, you should have been paying attention to it a long time ago. My dad, your host, Dr. Dahl, is a practicing emergency physician, blogger, author, and podcaster. He is not a licensed accountant, attorney, or financial advisor, so this podcast is for your entertainment and information only and should not be considered official, personalized financial advice.